Right, uh, welcome to another episode of Retro Power Uncut. Um, I thought we'd start here because we've just about finished the construction project, which um, we showed you a little glimpse of a couple of weeks ago. Um, also, what I think about it, just behind Jamie out of shot there, there's uh, a load of fresh uh, hoodies and t-shirts. These have gone really surprisingly well on the website. Um, and unlike a lot of people, we do actually get these made um, by, by a local company and ship them out ourselves here. So we have just restocked on all these. So if you've been on the website recently and everything was out of stock, go back on there now. There's loads in there. Uh, right, let's uh, have a little walk around. So first thing I think we're uh, going to encounter is James. Now, last week the Escort was on the ramp. Um, we were waiting for the new bushes to arrive that, uh, that we'd had made, the slightly softer version of the World Cup cross member um, rubber bushes. Um, now they arrived, so we were able to then get those fitted, get the, engine, get the engine and subframes back into the Escort and get that off the ramp. So there's all change in that uh, department. On the subject of those bushes, I have received various emails from people inquiring about purchasing a set. Um, I haven't replied to any of those emails yet, so don't worry if you haven't had a reply. I will get back to you. We only had the two bushes just as a sample to start with, uh, and the rest of the batch is going to be over the next few weeks. So um, I will reply to anybody who has asked about those bushes um, when we get that batch of bushes in so we can send them out. Um, with the Escort off the ramp, that enabled us to carry on the remaining bits, which we couldn't really do whilst, whilst it was stranded on the ramp. Um, so one of the things we did uh, over the last few weeks was do the electric power steering conversion on it. Um, and there's obviously a, an electrical side to that conversion, which we're now able to do. Now we can get the doors properly open. Um, so James has been working on the mounting of the ECU that controls that electric power steering system. Um, there was already a, a metal um, panel on the right hand kick panel of the car which had the engine ECU mounted on. Um, so James has essentially modified that drawing and made a revised version of that mount that now has a secondary mounting position on it for the electric power steering ECU. Uh, and I think what he's working on at the moment is a little shroud for the actual motor. Where the, where the actual electric column sits there's a motor out to one side which is just visible under the dash. So we're making a little shroud that's 3D printed which will slip over that motor cover the uglier bits of the motor assembly. Um, we're trying not to add sort of too much of a bulky shroud to it, so it's a really tight fit on the motor, and we're just gonna paint the very end of the motor casing black, and then have a black shroud that covers the uglier part of the, uh, of the casting. So that's what's going on with Gordon's car. Uh, as I say, it's off the ramp, and that finally enabled us to get this off its trolley for the first time since it was painted, and onto the ramp. Um, and then rather excitedly today, we have got the engine and gearbox in it. Um, so this is the kind of the moment we've been looking forward to. Um, we're on the brink of that period of where there's gonna be quite a lot of rapid change. At the moment, we're being a little bit held up by a plating batch, which is taking a bit longer than we'd hoped, a, a batch of zinc nickel plating, which includes the steering arms, uh, the rear hubs, the rear caliper brackets, um, and a couple of other parts for the gear shifter assembly. We concluded we'd still be able to fit the gear shifter with this in situ, so we've gone ahead and got that in anyway. Um, but we can't complete the work on the rear axle and actually get it rolling until we get those bits back from plating. But as soon as we've got that plating back, which I'm hoping will be in the next two or three days, um, we're gonna be in a position to get the rear hubs on, get the rear brake set up on this, um, and get the front subframe complete with the steering arms, front subframe on, and actually be in a position to get it rolling, albeit not on its final wheels. Um, now, the final wheels are in progress. Um, I'm not going to say what they are yet. I'll uh, leave that as a bit of a, a cliffhanger. Um, I imagine it's going to be a few weeks until we see them through, um, but I'm excited to see them on the car. I mean, that's obviously the thing that's always most exciting, I think, for most car guys, is <laughs> seeing the kind of final stance of the car on the final wheels. But just seeing the engine in there yeah, is absolutely amazing. And it has, has somewhat highlighted, though, the fact that we had this, U, it's a Jaguar X300 um, reservoir and master cylinder and servo. Uh, and the, we just cleaned up the a used reservoir and now, and now already I was thinking it probably didn't look good enough and now with the engine in there it definitely doesn't look good enough so I think we're going to have to, um, we could make a cover for it but I think what we'll probably do is do our own billet machined reservoir on there that, that somehow ties into the look of the rest of it. So now that's in, as I say that's only just gone in. 
Um, Trev, over the next few days, is going to start making progress, getting the final plumbing connections done, get the throttle bodies in there, um, and just start getting all the ancillaries in there. Um, we can do the aircon plumbing, um, we can get the radiator and the fan, etc., in there. We were holding fire on the um, breather tank, which is going to go up on the bulkhead over this side. Uh, we're going to do a, a sort of combined screen wash and breather tank. Um, and we were holding fire on that until we knew the exact uh, position of these breather outlets on the cam covers there versus the tank. So we could, when we design the tank, we'll get those unions welded on at just the right angle to give a nice pipe sweep up to that. Um, but yeah, on the whole, that's looking absolutely awesome. So um, pretty excited to see this progress. There's a couple of other things in progress at the minute which will tie in nicely. We've got a chrome batch which should be done by the end of this month. Um, it's February, I think it's the 11th of Feb today. Uh, should be done by the end of the month and that includes the top frames of the doors um, and quite a lot of uh, other sort of important chrome parts. What it doesn't include actually is the grill um, which we have now sourced the grill we're going to use. We had a, a, we've had a few discussions back and forth on the grill design. We, we juggled the idea for a while of, using, of doing our own billet version. Um, and then the more we, I talked with the customer about how we wanted it to look, so the more we realised we essentially wanted something very similar to the original Mark II grill, but just with all matching evenly spaced veins rather than having the one larger cast one in the middle. Um, and then by chance we just realised that a Mark I, a late Mark I Jag has exactly that. Um, so we just look, kept, look, kept on the lookout on forums and eBay and the, the rest of it until we managed to find a decent Mark I grill, offered that up and it looks exactly as we wanted it to look to be honest. So we're going to um, just get that re-chromed and we found a really good one so it needs one of the veins slightly straightening out. There's two holes at the top that'll need brazing up where the badge normally attaches, which we're not going to use. Um, but other than that, that's just going to be going away for chrome. These grills here, I think we showed those being designed on CAD previously. Uh, they're going to be machined next week. So hopefully we'll be able to see those next week and they'll be going in, in number two chrome batch, uh, which also includes the headlight bezels and the rear light surrounds. So that's another thing that's in progress in the meantime. So that's about it on Utah. Let's have a little walk through this way let me stop i'm gonna have a quick swig of coffee and just check my list here because i've missed some really obvious things on that straight away the um other thing we've been working on on utah is the interior which has been generally progressing over the last couple of weeks uh, dean's been working on the back seat um so we managed to get new foams for the back seat the frames were blasted and powder coated although they were the originals they needed a bit of repair work um so Dean's been patterning the rear seat, um, cutting that all out, cutting all those parts out of the leather that we're using, which is a cognac coloured uh, uh, Napa leather. Um, and then he's pretty much completed the rear seats. When I went up earlier today, he was just finishing the, the sort of trial fitting of the, the rear part of that um, seat cover. It's interesting to note actually, because uh, I think Jamie might have got some footage of this, is that if we're doing a, a, a seat cover that's being done for the first time rather than one we've tried and tested before and we've, we know the patterns are good. Dean will always do a trial first and just uses a, a cheap white vinyl for that. So he'll take all the patterns off the seat, do a complete set of the panels for the seats in white vinyl, stitch that together and do a trial fit first to be sure that the fit is good before then cutting all the parts from leather. Um, just so that we, if you get it wrong and it's not, it's not, per, not a perfect fit, you haven't wasted the leather. It's, it's a nice way of going about it. But yeah, he's about finished the front and rear seat covers now. So he's going to be moving on to the dash, which I think he's just starting to do the leathering on the dash now. Um, the other thing was, of course, fitting up the rear axle, but I probably have already talked about that. Uh, right, let's go this way. Through the silent door. And uh, first port of call would be the Morris. So Nat talked last week about um, doing a weld along a panel and the planishing process to smooth that out afterwards, um, which was uh, the sort of talk of the moment because Stu was letting in a new section around here because he, de he decided that the, although the original one was very close, it, it just wasn't quite right. Um, so he's a, this week he's been getting those completely finished and, and then carried on planishing and perfecting the shape 
and then he's been applying a, essentially a guide coat. It's, it's used engineers blue, but it's essentially a guide coat over there to then body file until he gets rid of any, any high spots, um, tapped up any low spots, uh, and just continued that process until, he, until he's happy with it. And then it's just been gone over it, a quick sand with the DA sander. Uh, I think this one's done, the other one's almost there. Um, it's probably notable from watching the progress on this over the few, last few weeks that it's, it's been quite typical um, in terms of a sheet metalwork project like this, in terms of, the, of you appear to achieve 90% of the work very quickly. And then it's that last 10% visually, that last 10% visual change takes 90% of the time. To get it from almost right to 100% to right takes so much more time than getting it from a flat sheet to most of the way there, or what seems to be most of the way there. So it's, it can be quite deceptive, um, that sort of sheet metalwork task. You get really excited because you think, blimey, he's done that quick. And, and then the last bit drags on, but it's fairly typical. Uh, the Chevette, Scott's been on this this week. Um, a lot of what he's been on so far has been uh, bonnet pins and boot pins. So on the back, we've gone for these little flush push button releases, um, which are a really, really neat solution. I'm always a little concerned about the security of the latch. I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't t typically use them on a bonnet. I'm sure there are plenty of people who do, but I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't want to risk it with no safety on the bonnet. With the boot, if it comes unlatched, it's not the end of the world, but they are pretty good. Um, and they're basically a little stainless steel ball joint that clicks into the back of a billet housing and you push it and it releases. And then when you click it back down, it locks back into place. Um, now it's a little bit more of a complicated job than you might think because the, the boot frame interferes with this area. Um, and because the billet housing has to go through a, th a, th a relatively thin skin, you can't, put it th you can't extend it through the inner frame as well. Um, and it doesn't look very tidy if you just leave a, a ragged hole in, in the inside frame. So what we've done is put a large hole on the inside frame and then essentially fabricate a cylinder that, that extends that up um, to the outer skin uh, with a gap in the side of it there. So, so you, the inner frame actually steps out to the outer skin and the two are pinched together by that billet piece with the lock nut on the back of it. Um, just makes a really neat job of it. And then the, the receptacles that he's fabricated here slot into that gap in the frame that he fabricated. Now, before getting onto that, he also needed to ascertain the position for those. Um, and there's a spoiler going on here. So we did a trial fit of that spoiler uh, and also made provision for the bolts on that. They're typically just bonded on and smoothed out and we didn't really want to do that. As with all the body kit, we're leaving it completely separate. So it's all gonna be bolt on panels. Um, and what we generally do is, is actually remold the back, the, the mating face of those panels by applying just parcel tape in our case onto the body, uh, applying a, a layer of filler onto the back of the panel, fiberglass filler, and then, and then actually fitting them into place. So they actually take a mold of the shape of the car to make sure they're a perfect fit. Um, and he's done that on the spoiler this week and also then put holes in for rib nuts on the back. Uh, and reinforce the areas on the spoiler where the bolts are going to go through and counter something them. So that once that spoiler prep work's all done, it'll literally just be a bolt-on panel. And he needed to get that done before doing those so we could make sure the position was right. <coughs> uh, on the front, also pins on the front. Now it's error catches on the front. Um, you've probably seen them, these little oval-shaped flush-fitting um, latches, if you like, where you push a little release the lever flips up and then you can you can open the bonnet and they're a much more they're much they're probably a more secure fitting than the ones we use on the boot because there's a pin that actually goes through a hole so it can't really fail um and the latch you know there's two stages to the latch so short of something actually breaking they're very unlikely to fail now on the front ones we needed to put them behind the the frame otherwise they would end up partially cut into the reinforcement frame of the bonnet um, which would look untidy. So we put them just as far forward as we could get them without interfering with that frame. Um, and that then means that the pins end up quite a long way back. So it was trying to come up with a neat way. If you imagine this wasn't here, which it wasn't before, the pins are sort of hovering in free space a long way away from any structure. So we, we did a few ideas. We thought about completely encasing in this corner. We thought about doing some tubular structure from down here. Um, none of it seemed that pleasing. So we came upon the idea of 
making it almost look like a corner with a triangular cutout in it. And so we've just done a folded little channel section with the downward fold that matches the downward fold on the back of this slam panel and then carried that on in it with a rounded corner. So by the time this is all prepped out and painted, it's almost going to look as if that is part of that front panel. And there's essentially just a triangular cutout in there. So that's looking really neat. Um, we've been doing a little bit of design work on the lights for this car. I'll probably touch more on that another time. We're going to do our own interpretation of the early style headlights that were sort of recessed, but with a billet machine surround and Hella projector units, Xenon projector units that are going to go in there. And we're going to do our own uh, rear light design as well, but we'll look at that a bit more next week. Uh, so that's Chevette. Uh, Jensen, Nat's been onto this. Uh, he was just designing the rear chassis leg sections last week um, to mount up the Jaguar IRS into the Jensen chassis. Um, I think at the end of when we did the video last week, he was just tacking those, those plates into place to get everything positioned correctly. Um, the continuation of that is he's now done the closing piece that runs across over the top of that um, independent rear subframe. He's finished doing the welding of these plates, fully welded them all the way around. Also drilled a lot of holes and plug welded through, which you can't now see because they've all been dressed and ground back. Um, then he's designed and welded in the first sections of the closing structure that, that will merge the original Jensen sh shape into the revised chassis rail design. Um, now it's been a lot of this sort of last week of work has been that kind of head scratching designing, working out how to do it all, how it's going to look neat and be strong. Um, and then start to draw up the parts that he's going to need. So I think actually from now on for the next week, uh, the progress will be quite a lot quicker. Now he's got through that planning and design stage. Um, but essentially there's a, a chamfered panel here that angles out from the original Jensen chassis blade there and then merges that into the side of the revised chassis rail there. Um, this section is a single skin at the moment, but once that subframe's dropped out, there's another cross member that will come up under here and essentially form a box section across this front edge here. So there'll be a, a solid box section running across here. Um, and then off the back of the tubular chassis legs down here, which originally tied up into the turrets here via a diagonal uh, member on the back of the bulkhead, that is gonna have a new version of that diagonal which comes up and ties into that box that's created by the front corner of this section here, um, which will just really tie the whole structure together then. So we've tied the original turret structure, which is no longer gonna be holding a damper, um, into our revised chassis leg, into the original Jensen chassis blade, which was already a, an upgraded part from a convertible interceptor, so it was a lot stronger than the normal CV8 one. Um, all of that structure is tied together and then will be triangulated down into the back of these chassis tubes. So I think it's going to be an extremely strong structure. And I think the next steps will, will go a lot quicker. We should be able to get this panel work done here. Once, that's, once this has dropped out, the cross member's done here. That panel work should go together fairly quickly. And then there's a bit of a decision how to go about the rear section here. There'll be an angled closing plate across here and we'll be debating whether to just replace the whole of this boot floor with a slightly neater design or to leave some of what's there. But next week we'll find out what the uh, chosen direction on that will be. Um, and I think he's looking forward then to once that lot's nipped in the bud to getting the engine mounts and transmission mounts done. Um, and I think the next step after that is going to be starting to do the modifications to the bulkhead um, that are associated with the new air conditioning system that we're going to be fitting to the car. So we'll go into that as, uh, as and when we can get to it. One thing I just remembered I forgot to talk about, which we forgot to in the last couple of weeks, the front panel on the Chevette, we decided to make this bolt on. So that was some work we, were, we did a couple of weeks back, or certainly over a week ago. Um, when we had this through in the body shop briefly, doing some of the trial body kit fit, we realised that when you got the bonnet lined up with the scuttle side to side, it didn't line up with the slam panel. The, the gaps this way were fine, but the slam panel was offset to one side, and, it, and actually the car had had a bit of an accident on that corner. So I think the, the slam panel had been, um, or the whole nose section had been pushed this way by about sort of seven, eight mil. So to rectify that, we, we're gonna have to drill the spot welds on the back of this nose panel and the spot welds on the tabs that attach it to the panels under the headlights here and take it off and move it over by eight mil. But whilst we were doing that, we kind of were looking at it thinking, well, actually it doesn't really offer much uh, structural to the, the car at all. 
um, especially not with the revised stronger structure we've got around the radiator where we've done the surround for that. Um, it doesn't really bring a lot to the party being a, an integral part of the shell so we decided to make it bolt on. So we've, we've made a new flange that ran along here um, and then little brackets that are spot welded to the back of the nose panel and it literally just bolts on along here now and then there's a couple of bolts going to be on each side here they're just they're just screws at the minute but they'll be replaced with um, rib nuts and bolts so that nose panel will be completely unboltable which has a couple of benefits really i mean it's going to be a lot easier to paint that area there's normally an area up under here which is quite difficult to get paint into so with that unboltable it's much easier to get paint on the back of this panel and in all the area area that would normally be hidden by it um, and also if it does get a bit of a, a knock on the front end it's not going to be the end of the world to take that panel off and replace it with another one. We'd obviously have to do the conversion with the adding of the brackets on the new panel, but it, it does mean we haven't got to drill all the spot welds out and damage the, the paint on the, on the body shell. Uh, so that's that. Uh, and talking of body shells, the Camaro is in the booth. Uh, and it is Camaro, not Camaro. <laughs> like obviously, I'm in the minority saying that, but I'm going to continue doing it anyway. Um, the body shell for that we, was here last week and we were just finishing off the tail end metalwork details so um, we needed to kind of do a nitpicking list if you like where we got the car on the rotisserie and I just went over the whole thing looking for any little flanges that weren't quite straight, any little pinholes in welds, um, anything that we weren't completely happy with and also adding the provision for some of the plumbing routing so we'd never had it on the rotisserie um, since having it mechanically built. Um, so now we knew where the fuel lines were going to run. We drilled holes to put rib nuts in for those. Um, so with that lot done, we then wanted to get to the position where that was in epoxy primer so we could store it for a bit until it reaches the front of the queue for paintwork. Um, so the process there is once we've got that, all the metalwork detail finished, we put it into our blasting room, um, blast the shell, which we do with crushed glass. Uh, we use like a mixed, a mixed grade of crushed glass. Um, we generally actually create that mixed grade ourselves. We buy in coarse grade and then we mix it in with some of the glass that's already been through the blaster, so it's a much finer grade. Um, and that's just really nice because the, the, the fresh coarse stuff really strips fast, but it kind of doesn't infill the detail very quickly. Um, and the finer stuff kind of strips, fills in all the gaps that the coarser stuff has left behind quite quickly. So it works really well. Um, so we do that. Uh, and then immediately after blasting, uh, before there's any time for any surface corrosion to appear, we do our um, zinc metal spray process on the underside. We've probably talked about this before. Um, it's an oxypropane gun with a compressed air feed uh, and a, a feed of solid zinc wire that goes into it. Um, and there's like a little air fed turbine that feeds the wire in the oxypropane flame melts it and it literally sprays molten zinc. Um, so we then spray flame spray the whole of the underside of the body um, with zinc which gives it incredibly tough corrosion resistance um, because of the way zinc protects the, the cathodic protection it provides it means that even if you scratch that zinc through to the bare steel it still protects it so we've done uh, we've had some industry standard salt spray tests done previously with this process where we've literally done uh, a zinc sprayed panel um, wrapped in it which is the, the product that we use over the top of that and then had it scratched through to the bare steel and put in a salt spray and they, I think they reached, it's a warm spray, it's the industry, st industry, uh, woo, industry standard test. Uh, I think they reached about 3,000 hours before they, they took it out and said it's, it's pretty much not going to rust, um, which is comparable to something like 50 years of uh, offshore, offshore service in you know, the oil industry and that sort of thing. So more than, more than enough for a car. So once we've done the zinc spray, we get it back off the spit, put it on a trolley, put the trolley into the paint booth. Um, we then spray the entire upper, face, upper surfaces of the car um, with an epoxy primer. And at that point, it's all, it's all sealed in. We've covered all the bare steel. It's got the zinc spray on the underside, epoxy primer everywhere else. Um, and then that can be put to one side until we're ready to start prepping for paint. So that's kind of next in the queue after the Mustang. The Chevette's going to be thrown into the mix as well. I'm hoping in the next sort of few weeks, we're going to be getting towards the end of metal work on this. So uh, Gaz is going to have his work cut out with a, a pretty serious queue of cars to prep for paint. Uh, and on that note, I think we'll uh, call it a day and we'll catch up again next week. See you then.